Uh, I was asked to speak here, um, and about a month ago they said, well, what are you going to talk about? You have to have a, a, a name for this lecture. And I said, well, how do I pick out a name for what I'm going to say because I haven't been here yet. I don't know what to say because I, how can you project into the future what people are going to want to hear or need to hear? My father and grandfather were very good at reading a room. Uh, Grandpa Wallace Black Elk um, used to uh, start a lecture, and, and I can't do it the way he used to do it. I mean, that takes a lot of time, and, and um, he would start by, you know, he would start a subject, like number one, and then he'd go to an, like another obscure fact, and number two, number three, number four, and then he'd go around in a circle, and then he'd go back to the very beginning and add a little bit more, and then he'd go to number two and add a little bit more over the course of an hour, and then he'd go back to the beginning, and he'd add a little bit more, and just keep doing it like in a spiral, and at the very end, he'd just pull them all together and they'd all be connected, where you think they're all these obscure things and suddenly they're all in one. And that was a real art form, and not many people have that today. That takes, that takes time and experience to develop that. I don't have that. I was, my head was, is linear because I was educated in the Western way. He said, I got educated stupid because <laughs> I collected all these degrees and they taught me to think in a linear way. He uh, didn't learn to read early on in life, and that's, he thinks that's why he had total recall. Sometimes when you learn to read too, ear, too early, you start writing things down. And it gives you permission to forget things. So I'll, I'll remember it later because I'm going to write it down in a notebook. But when you can't write things down in a notebook, you remember everything. Uh, on my Mongolian side, I had a grandfather who remembered everything. He remembered every person he met, he remembered, and he knew who they were related to. And I thought, how could he have such a powerful memory? Well, he, he never learned to read, so he had to remember everything. And he retained that memory. He spoke five languages because he couldn't read, but he taught himself how to read later. And I think maybe that ruined him and hurt, it, hurt his memory a little bit by learning how to read. This is an oral tradition. I mean, it's not written in, in books and things. Uh, years ago, my dad was speaking at, uh, at a college in, in Ohio. And, and uh, it was a huge audience. There were hundreds and hundreds of people there. And he was getting ready to go out on stage. And one of the, uh, the president of the college came over and he said, well, where are your lecture notes? And Dad said, well, I don't have any lecture notes. And he said, well, what are you going to talk about? And he said, well, I don't know. I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> and the president got all paler than he was, and he walked out on stage, and Dad went out on stage, and he started you know, meandering and talking a little bit and started zeroing in on what the problem was. Because they invited him to speak, and they thought he was going to be like, some kind of dime store Indian. He was going to tell quaint stories and bang a tom-tom or something like that and tell, I don't know what they, what they expected, but they weren't expecting uh, a spiritual man. And when you invite a spiritual man like him to speak, he's not going to talk about some trivial thing. He's going to try to talk about what's appropriate to the room and what's important, what the dominant thought was. So he began to speak and um, he spoke uh, he started to address the alcoholism on campus among the faculty. <laughs> and that was the dominant problem that the school was dealing with at the time. They didn't expect that. And he hit a bullseye. But we never got invited back again. <laughs> but that was what the dominant thought was, and he read the room in that way. Uh, I always admired that. When uh, Michelle Obama came to Asheville and she gave this wonderful talk uh, at UNCA uh, uh, just before her, her uh, husband became elected president. Um, she was representing him and she got up on stage and it was a real windy day and she got up there with all of her notes and uh, th this big gust of wind came and blew her skirt up like a Marilyn Monroe th uh, scene up over her head and her papers just went up into the air and they flew all the way over into Tennessee. <laughs> and, and she was there and she pulled her skirt down and she said, well, I guess you all saw a part of me few people get to see. <laughs> and then she proceeded to give this incredible lecture from her heart because she didn't have any papers. And everyone wanted to elect her president to hear this woman speak so elegantly and, and movingly about her husband and things it was just, it was a powerful moment because they didn't have papers. And in a traditional way, you don't speak publicly till you're at least 35 or so. Uh, in my younger days, I collected a small pile of degrees uh, like from Johns Hopkins and 
Peabody Conservatory and things. I'm a professional musician. And I, so I got a pile of degrees to prove that I had a brain. And, but, you know, I, I, I thought I knew something because I had all those degrees. But you're not allowed to speak till you're at least middle age because you'll just embarrass yourself. <laughs> it's on, only until you're middle age that you actually have some of life experience so you could back up what you're saying. You really don't know what you're talking about till you start to get that. And as you get older, I find you, you're less embarrassed about what you're saying as you get older. I'm 52 years old, so I'm about 48% embarrassed about what I say if I listen to this lecture. And I don't know whether you get smarter, you just don't care as you get older. <laughs> Maybe it's a combination of both. It gives you the permission. So I, um, I got out on stage in front of a bunch of people because Dad said, well, tonight you're going to get to speak. And this was over in uh, Greensboro, and there was a lecture there. And I finally got, got to speak over in Greensboro. And uh, tell me if you can't hear me. So I got to speak on Greensboro, and I did what a good student, what I was taught to at school, and I went and I got all my notes, the lecture notes all prepared, and I was getting in and had in front of the crowd, and, and our dad walked out and just looked and go, hmm, like that, hmm. I said, what's that? I said, well, those are my notes. And he said, let me see those. This is in front of a, a million people. And he took my notes, and he walked off stage. <laughs> But be, before he left, he said, if it's not in your heart, you don't have it. If it's not in your heart, you don't have it. So that was the last I was allowed to bring notes. Uh, my father was the best teacher I ever had because, uh, in a way, he never taught me anything. He, he only would ask me a question and push me in that direction. He never gave me the answers because he knew I wouldn't appreciate them. I'd write them down and forget them somewhere. It was a, with my father, you had to work for those answers. He would just nudge you one way or nudge you another way and just keep you going. He'd say, well, no, you've got to keep going. You haven't gotten there yet. Or uh, you're way off or something like that. He was usually way off. But he would just give you a push and let you find the answers for yourself, which is the only true way you're going to learn. And remember, we have to, our problems are our problems. And if I was in your body or you were in mine, you probably solve my problems in an instant. But we wouldn't grow from that. So we just have to work on our own problems that way. Uh, my father, when he was uh, alive, he was kind of, I felt like he was given a bum rap in, in many ways. You know, he, he uh, grew up on Rosebud. He has a Rosebud ID number. Uh, he's not read, he, they couldn't find any record of his birth because when he was young, <laughs> He and all the children who were born that time had their birth records, the birth certificates in the hospital at that time. And I don't know where they were keeping the records, but it got burned down. So he and all the kids at that time don't really exist. They don't, he doesn't have, didn't have a birth certificate, so he can't prove anything. So he's just, so that, he had a difficulty in that time. He, uh, he didn't like white people at all uh, at the very beginning. And, and he had a very difficult time. And his spiritual teacher, uh, Grandfather Wallace, understood that about him. And Grandfather Wallace had a vision that, that the white people were going to destroy the world with the nuclear weapons and uh, the destruction. And he felt he had to do what he could to try and educate, to try to give our most precious things, with our, which are the teachings. The teachings on how to live to the planet, you know, on this planet, the instructions that everyone had at the beginning of time but maybe lost when they got conquered by somebody else and accepted their way and lost their own. Accepted somebody else's songs instead of their own family songs. And over time, in thousands of years, people drifted further and further away. And Grandfather saw this happening, so he wanted to get people back to basic teachings of earth, rock, water, and the green. So he was on that mission to do that.